Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, South Africa. These are five emerging economies that are effectively joining forces, right? And when you think of the people there, mm -hmm. Brazil's not small. A good majority of the population. India's not small. And if you also look geographically, they can cover the globe mm -hmm. from a shipping perspective. They're also adjacent to a number of other highly populated, early, early development e economies. If the battle is for people and cheap products, ultimately, and for a while the Western world won that, and as a result, their current dominated that currency you're talking about that is going to be tapped into these economies that is a major 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 shift in world economics that's not going to last for like five years it's going to last for potentially to five generations It's not that early, but it's bright in here and it's dark out there it's and it's early. cold and it's gross. You sent me a text last night being like, you actually going to be there? I was actually here. I was almost early if everyone didn't slide off the road this morning. I actually got a really good parking spot over there. That's one nice thing about coming in this early. I but I've been thinking about this and I want to pick your brain on it. Oh and, yeah, I got to feed the meter. Continue, sorry. This is like a... So you know, like, we adopted our boys. Yes. So we got them a little bit later in their lives. Yep. And I've been running to some degree these experiments on them in the sense that like... <laughs> Is this something you want to talk about on the pod? <laughs> well, like, I honestly feel that if you can understand Water childhood <laughs> childhood <laughs> development, you can better understand yourself and you can better understand like what makes a successful person. Yep. And I always like looking at myself being like, why am I the way I am? Both for for good and, and for bad, yeah. right? Like what, okay. what things have made me successful what are, are my shortcomings and, and what might have contributed to those? So I'm yeah. interested in that in my kids for a couple of reasons. One, I wasn't there, unfortunately, for the start of their lives when a lot yeah. of development stuff happens. Yeah. Um, I also, they do not have my genetic makeup. Yeah. Um, and then I also feel like I have a responsibility as a parent to make sure they're not little shitheads. Yeah. Um, and I mean that both as youth, but also when they grow into adults. Yeah. Like I look around, I see a lot of adults. I'm like, my God, whose child is this? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. and so I'm very tuned in and I, I, I want them to be great people. Good science and Great, great, great in, 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 you know, the, their empathy. And, and fortunately they come by that naturally, especially my older son, like he's a sweetheart but also contributing members, productive members, hardworking individuals. Yeah. Um, and we've talked a lot about this, and this is why this is very much on my mind. We talked about this in yeah. a couple episodes, and um, I recently went down this rabbit hole. Like, I love boxing. There's a lot of, you know, uh, um, you know there's a lot of, of roughhouse sports out there, you know, jujitsu, wrestling, yeah. you know, all this stuff. Me, personally, I just, I, I just love boxing. So I've always liked the idea of my kids boxing, and it got me thinking about how, like, there's all these stigmas associated around a lot of contact sports these yeah. days. And you think of, like, how now we've always often told, like, young girls, like, to not be physical or, or put this, like, societal, yeah. you know, expectation on, you know, female to, to be, females to be less physical, right? Yeah. Um, wrongly so. But also on boys, like, you know, not wrestle and hey calm down and separate them and keep your hands to yourselves and all of these things and i went down this rabbit hole of like rough play and how good it is for development and stuff like this yeah um and i don't mean like beating on each other but like kids want to wrestle and the same way like if you look at like uh, a, a bunch of little puppies they're wrestling each other you look at a bunch of like bear cubs they're wrestling each other yeah, yeah. and looking into it and all this stuff about how it builds a lot of like physical awareness, like of your own personal space and how to handle other individuals in your space and, and, you know, just understand the mechanics of how your body work. Yeah. But it also begins like your understanding of negotiation. Um, and, you know, this give and take of, well, this is play, right? But if we wrestle, like we both want to like enjoy it and no one get hurt and all these things and you build these dynamics and... Depends who you're wrestling. It's this idea of like how conflict actually builds like peace and, and better relationship in a weird way because you need to have this back and forth almost antagonistic but a well-intentioned antagonistic relationship to have a better understanding with each other um it's like the speech from like a leader of a big country who's preparing to go to war <laughs> no not at all like i'm going somewhere with this i'm going okay, somewhere all right, with all right, this all right, all right, all right. um like did you did you play any contact sports when you were little 
I played a bit, but I'll be honest, the reason I was, I was like, my parents were not super for it was, uh, and the one thing I'm thinking as you're saying all this is head injuries. That was like yeah, the yeah. biggest one. Oh my God, my so, mom yeah. was like not opposed to me, like roughhousing with my buddies or with my brother. But at the end of the day with sports, she was just so concerned about me getting head injuries because the long-term impact, she's like when you're 40, 50, totally, whatever it is. Totally. It's going to have a, that, and that's why like the boxing was super cool. I know my brother did it for a bit. I kind of wanted to do it, but there was always that concern that if you ever got to like a competitive level, um, and not even like a high level competitive, just even like doing the odd, like serious sparring match, like yeah, you could damage your dome. And so that yeah. was, and same with football. So we played like basketball, soccer, uh, we did snowboarding, but we always had to wear all the gear and stuff. And yeah. like, but even those yeah. I think are good because like, again, you're like, you're figuring out your limits, um, you know, you're, you're figuring out how your body moves and, and, and 100%. all these things. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, and work with the team, but there is this whole thing with kids now. It's like, hands yourself, don't touch anyone ever, blah, 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 blah. And I find myself doing that with my kids, one with each other, you COVID know, probably perpetuated that too. Oh, hundred percent. But like anytime my kids are arguing or whatever, I, I basically separate them. And increasingly I'm like, man, I got to let them figure it out to some degree because it's like anything else like you kind of push the limit then you're like ah okay that's too far but now i know that and now we have a better relationship of how far we can push each other yeah. like everyone's like kind of ragged on one of their friends and all of a sudden their friend snaps and it's like okay damn like now i know a little bit more about that person <laughs> um but increasingly like we don't let kids do this and i've been guilty of this like my older son and and I, I never know like this part of this is ADHD is part of this. The fact that when he was very young, he didn't have a lot of interaction with other kids and other people like mm -hmm. he is in other people's spaces. Okay. Right. And, and he struggles with that because it alienates some of his peers. Cause he's just like a lot. And I've been trying to like tone him down on that. And I'm like, you know what, man, at some point, like he's got to just do it. And the other kids are going to be like, Hey man, get out of my space. And that'll actually probably be that'll better him for be, him. Yeah. Um, and like, a really good buddy of mine, he's got three boys and, and two of them are rolling around doing jujitsu already. And you can see like, they just have fun. And obviously one of them is way bigger than the other because it's the older brother and the little brother. But what do they do? Well, the older brother lets the little brother take him down. And the yeah. older brother knows that he can pin the little brother, but doesn't do it all the time. Like they develop this really good way of interacting. And yeah. it gives you this understanding of how people are wired and how they're going to respond to you. And I think you know, again, I went down this rabbit hole. This isn't all me figuring this stuff out, but like this idea that that makes you better at conflict resolution. I don't mean because like you're strong and you can fight people, but actually you can read people and read body language and, and how people interact and, and give and take and control your aggression and all these things. Uh, but then also I just think how you like negotiate your way through life and and maybe even how your your relationships with, with your partners and, and all this stuff. Um, and then it got me talking about like, we just raised a whole generation that basically didn't do that. They didn't play contact sports because they were afraid of head injuries. They weren't allowed to wrestle on the playgrounds because, you know, someone got clothesline playing Red Rover, and now it's like, well, we can't do that ever yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, increasingly a lot of contact sports are very expensive uh, or they're stigmatized. Like football and hockey would be expensive, and yeah. they're like boxing and wrestling and jiu-jitsu would be stigmatized to some degree. Um, you know, so we're, we're taking these things away from kids, which, you know, historically was definitely part of their development. And then it's the question of like, well, what do they do if they're in that situation? So what happens is when like kids can never argue and resolve it on their own and blah, 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 blah. The thing they do is when one of them steps out of line rather than the other one correcting them, they call their parent. They tattle. For lack of a better term, they become tattlers. Yeah, yeah. Right? And what happens when you Breed reach a, a certain... a bunch of wieners. They become a bunch of wieners. And those wieners... <laughs> I have no up. kids, so it's hard for me to rationalize, but yeah. No, but like, think now of people maybe your age that have grown up and are tattling weenies because they can't resolve anything themselves. These are the people that call in my permits and get HRM to come inspect the sites. You're not, this is where I'm going with this. We're breeding Karens. I think we are literally. No beef on the name, just. Yeah, shout out to my mother-in-law, Karen. <laughs> um, but we are breeding these people who they don't conflict resolve themselves and they don't have the tools and they don't have the foresight to see a conflict coming mm. and know how to navigate it. So what do they do? They tattle. And when you reach a certain age, you know, you don't have your parents. Who do you tattle to? You tattle to social media. You tattle I was to say, this is where you go to social news. media and you get people you tattle, like, bitching you know, on there and doing all this. And so when someone stuff. goes on there and, and has a gripe in their life, they go on and they tell their internet mommy and daddy, right? Cause they know 
Like, what are your what are your parental figures? They're the people that are going to reaffirm you, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's also that thing where, like, every parent now just, like, babies are kidding. Like, you're right every time. The teacher was not wrong, you know, or the teacher was not right. That other kid on the playground that pushed you was not right. All of these things, you are yeah. right, they are wrong. And that people find that now in these social media vacuums. So when I see these people, this all relates back to complaints against landlords. Invest in risk. And, and people complaining about their lot in life. Like... Mm. To some degree, like I think if there was more um, ability to resolve conflict in an adult professional manner with some of these uh, grown up weenies, like <laughs> they wouldn't find themselves in some of these scenarios. These full size weenies. Um, and yes, there are, there are some cases where people have been taken advantage of. But can you, like, this is, comes back to this fixed term lease thing when someone says, Hey, I agreed to sign a contract and it started on this date and it ended on this date. And at the end of yeah. it, I couldn't just still have <laughs> the exact thing I wanted, no matter what. I know. And then they tattle to uh-huh. whoever will listen. Their internet mummies and daddies, they tattle. Well, in this and case, it's like the Canadian government. You know, this is what we've created. And you see these people, they pray them out. They look like, you know, grown up Peter Pan's being like, this happened to me. And it's like, well, yeah, man, that is what you signed. <laughs> like, that is a contract that you signed. Think of professional sports. Start date, end date. There's no professional athlete who's like, man, at the end of my contract, I they want didn't my 15 just, million dollars to keep just, rolling. Run it back. Run it back. It's like, that's not what you signed. And it's a shame because if some of these people were, you know, more willing to um, understand the system, and a lot of them say that they don't want to understand the system. They just, landlords are bad. And it like... Even though it's your housing, you need to understand it. Like yeah, wouldn't you want to go live. into this and confront this thing and navigate it and negotiate it with it? And, it's and, uncomfortable, and, so they avoid and it. And wrestle with it, yeah. metaphorically speaking, Yeah. so that you know it. And then maybe you can go, listen, I'm interested in signing a lease for this property. Yeah. I would like to sign a two-year fixed-term lease. What up? Okay. And I'm even willing to... Um, put an increase in it if we can agree to an increase today. Yeah, or the 5%, um, that's allowed. You know, like, I, I, I'd i be willing to sign it right now, but I would like some security. I'm a great tenant. I would like to do a two-year term. Yeah, I even yeah. had a single person ever in 14 years ask me for a two-year term. And I would have happily given it if they were a good tenant. Like, I, I said, like, hey, yeah. you know, provided you've paid every rent on time, like, boom, we're good. Like, instead, they get to the end of it, they throw up their hands like, I can't believe this. And... If they talk to the landlord, which I guarantee they don't, they they would maybe send like a passive aggressive text or an email that they wrote at eleven forty seven p.m. after talking to every single person in their social network. A couple beers, you know, thrown it online, got you know, um, crowdsourced uh, their speaking points in a vacuum that's just going to tell them what they already believe, <laughs> rather than like say picking up the phone saying, "Hey, like, can we talk about this?" Like, you know, I just think conflict where we're we're. we're Teaching all these generations Chandler of people to like avoid conflict. would like to square up with all of these people to teach them some <laughs> conflict is what he's getting at. This is the long and short no, of it. No, and man, this is, and it is super early. Like, yeah, I'd say this is good morning. Starting. How you doing? Yeah. How was your night? This is the Master Keys Leave podcast. Leave a message at 1147 last night. This is the Master Keys podcast. Oh my gosh. I'm Neil Andrino. I'm Chandler Halbert. Feel free to edit that. Whatever. Take I, it I think it's I good. Know. I want to add one thing to your rant. I mean, it's the first time tuning in. This is a, a podcast all about real estate. Real estate investors, real estate agents, and uh, we just try and bring you some news headlines and what's going on in today's world and what we're seeing and, and trying to give you some insights so you can make better decisions out there. We are not financial advisors, though. Now, I want to add to your thing of what you just said there about yeah. the, the two-year leases. So if you listen to that whole intro, Chandler had a very interesting point regarding uh, I don't know if I had a point at all. And, and, no, and, you kind of did. Like, my the, ass, but I came across this guy, I think his name is Raffi. He had a great conversation with Jordan Peterson. If you're interested in this sort of stuff, check it out. You know that I'm a fan of skateboarding. I've got my kid in skateboarding because I, you know, I feel like testing your limits, putting yourself in difficult situations, and persistence are good attributes. And I, I feel like these things are learned at a young age. That's yeah, the, the development the of people at a young age and how how they end up ultimately dealing with conflict. And in this case, the one the hot topic conflict that everyone's having to deal with here in Canada is real estate, especially if they're renting a space from somebody. You mentioned that on average. No one actually, sorry, not on average, no one in the 14 years of your career has asked you for a multi-year lease to have some consistency and not, not be once. concerned because right now there's a big pushback on fixed term leases and they're saying we shouldn't be allowed to have fixed term leases because it benefits the landlord. And it's like, no, not actually, because if you could use it to benefit yourself and say, I want a five year fixed term. So now I get this place for five years and that benefits the tenant. Um, but no one thinks about it like that. They just look at it in a way that's going to make it impossible for a landlord to have any sort of functionality and just it's effectively crippling for a landlord. Anyways, 
Um, one thing I want to add to that is I lived in a building downtown, um, and it was on average more expensive than the market, probably by almost double. Um, and they very commonly got requests and signed extended terms mm-hmm. up to 10 years for the resident, for their tenants. I rented a space wow. downtown and when I rented, they were surprised that I didn't want a minimum of two to three years. Wow. They said most of the yep. leases they signed were longer term. Yep. Now it, it's, it's, it's interesting that it's, for me, it's like, okay, so that's a very expensive high-end building. It You're also getting, would be a building that skews a little bit older, a generation that's got more experience and maybe... Education in the, in the situation. Yep. And I'm not saying like it's a confrontation in the sense of, you know, a physical confrontation or like a battle, blah, blah, blah. It's more confronting things that are maybe ideas and systems that you don't necessarily agree with. And I do this with all my... Ten- like, I've been showing in, in a couple apartments recently. And yep. every time I'm in there, I run into a, a tenant yep. or the, an existing tenant. Yep. And they usually say, oh, hey, you showing one of the apartments? And I go, yep. And I, like, we have a full-on conversation about the, the state of things. Yeah. And I'm very direct with them because people don't talk about this stuff. And I say, yeah, the rent for the new unit right now is seventeen twenty-five, And I yep. know, like, I see this person and I see their wheels turn. And they're at, like, 1200 Yep. Right. And they go, wow. And I'm like, yeah, it's crazy. You know, I put it up for 24 hours. I had 40 or I had 100 inquiries and I had 40 people complete an online application in 24 hours. Um, and we will get into a conversation like, yeah, it's harder than blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. And the tricky thing is, you know, I mean, this is no disrespect to you, but because I can only raise your rent $26 and, you know, they're paying my, my, my taxes are through the roof. My insurance is through the roof. My electricity is through the roof. And I haven't been able to raise it anything for 24 months. Like these people get smoked. Yeah. And, I see them look at me and I can see the first thing they say is like, I don't want to talk about this. Like sometimes they like, you know, cause they're not used to having these real conversations and, and I can see them trying to process and being like, this sounds bad. I should be angry, but I don't know if I am. And he seems pretty chill about well, it. And you've, I'm, you've and I'm also, still here good. You, the, way, like, the way you brought it to them is, is interesting. And that's why I think they, they really, where people are like, well, wait, wait a second. Cause usually you'd be like 70, 25 and like, screw this guy. He's ripping them off. But then you're like, well, it's actually because this isn't fair that we don't have like a balanced rental market in this building yeah. that the new guy is covering your loss. Cause yeah. now your rent, your unit cost me $1,400 a month to carry. You only pay 1200. So instead of him only having to pay 1500, so I can make a hundred dollars profit, he has to pay 1700. Yeah. I have to take a hundred dollars from his and put it on yours to cover exactly. the makeup, the loss. And then they're like, Oh, so I, I want to be angry that he's charging a lot but he's actually charging a lot to cover my ass. Yeah. But you, when you see someone who's a, a well-adjusted person and I've got really good tenants who are smart and, and very capable and, and, you know, we can have real conversations like, yeah, you know, that makes sense and it's difficult. And, and, you know, we're really appreciative of our space here. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly, that, that's why you're here. And like, you're on fixed term and, you know, like I've also never ended someone's lease on a fixed term. Like yeah. I happen to have really good people who can have adult conversations with me and, you know, if ever there was a, a dispute, like we can work it out like adults because they are well-adjusted human beings, but yeah. a lot of people are not these days. And as a result, you can't have conversations because all people do is they say, ah, that scares me. I'm going to go tattle. So the moral story is don't beat your kids. Let your kids beat each other. But let them wrestle a little bit. Let them, you know, anyway, check out, like, I don't know if you, th- maybe I'm crazy and I, I, I am a little tired. It's, um, not, it's not for that reason. But I think it's, I think it's, it's all, all, and I know I'm a bit all over the place with this, but none of this is directly related to real estate, but we do comment on a lot of things that are going on today. Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to rag on these tenants because some of them genuinely do voice legitimate um, wrongs. However, the fact that um, they end up in this place a lot of time because they've refused to truly engage with and wrestle with the situation and understand the situation. Uh, and in the end, they just want to, you know, tattle to mom and dad, as opposed to learning like that grinds my gears. But anyway, what's new with you? Fight your kids. Uh, you got some, uh, you got some uh, news for me? Yeah. So, uh, again, it's early morning. Good morning. Um, I just want to mention something before we hop into it that I thought was kind of cool. Um, I didn't, I don't have a crazy grind to my gears, but I was driving in 
I live outside of town, which we've mentioned a bunch of times. Yeah. And I come in the highway that everybody would come in. Like if you're driving from Ontario, New Brunswick, it's the one main highway that comes in. It's from, one or two? Yeah. Yeah. And so as I was driving in, I, I see all sorts of interesting stuff. You see a lot of car carriers and like a lot of the stuff that's being shipped into this province. And a lot of shit that's getting shipped out because everything that comes in our port rips down that highway. Yeah, it starts here and goes up. Yeah, literally it starts right in front of this, this office we're in now and goes all the way out. Um, and then on the flip side, I, I get the same thing coming back in. And so this morning, um, outside of all the cars sliding off the road because of the freezing rain, I also noticed a first one. I saw one modular house. I didn't think much of it. It was homes by oh. ADF. Okay. And then I kept driving along and i'm a fast lane driver so i just kept going cruising along lead foot over here yeah and um i passed like four more of them and they're all the same and i was like you know what this is where they're going i think it's the nurse the nursing the modular housing that they're looking for to help house nursing because they were very nice they were very nice like they had nice exteriors very clean looking i'm like they look like they meant to sit in a hospital parking lot to be honest with you um Hmm. And they, they look very specked out. Like they had a lot of little, a lot of venting on the outsides and stuff like that. Like I'm like, okay, these look like they're designed to to actually handle something and they're probably very expensive. I'm trying to look them up uh, online here right now. ADF Where's that going? Homes. Where are those going? I don't know where they're physically going to yeah. be dropping them. Um, it's supposed to be around the hospitals to, to, to house nurses as far as I understand. Yeah, they'll probably pop a bunch down uh, outside Dartmouth General, I would think. I don't know where they'd fit Dartmouth in Halifax. Dartmouth General's got a ton of space. Yeah, Dartmouth General has space, but but the, the Halifax, Halifax places don't have space. I mean, they were struggling to find that parking garage. But Maybe Halifax Shopping Center? Like, they take they a, park, a parking lot in the back and they commute in, but then they have, like, they're close to the shopping center. I could see that maybe. Yeah, I could see that, like, uh, behind the... It's like one of the few Atlantic. peninsula spaces yeah, yeah, that yeah, isn't yeah. really fully utilized. Um, anyways, I saw that. I thought it was kind of interesting. Like I said, the first one didn't cue me for anything, and then I was like, well, wait a second, there's a, there's a bunch of these things. It's, this is not just, like, a... Like someone thought someone just buying a trailer. It's it's it's. Yeah. So that would be the provincial government <clears throat> purchasing those and then bringing in the nurses or um, leasing them. Potentially, they also rolled out some like benefits, and I I kind of like that they greased New Brunswick on it a little bit because um, <laughs> all of the Atlantic <laughs> provinces. No offense, New Brunswick, but like all the Atlantic provinces <laughs> screwed them. Um, compete for well everything, uh, but right now are really competing for labor, especially with healthcare. And they kind of all t- got together and were like, "Hey, let's try to work on this together." Because in a lot of cases, depending on the type of care you need, you might go interprovincially. You you definitely might go from those provinces to here in Halifax, where we have maybe bigger hospitals. Um, but like as a surprise part of the provincial budget, like they offered these bonuses to nurses who both stayed here, but also came here and like some tax benefits, I think up to 30,000 and all these things and didn't tell the other provinces. So these other provinces who might've been thinking that they were going to get some nurses coming back that were only here temporarily, or, you know, everyone's going to put out their, their recruitment portfolio yeah, and Nova yeah. Scotia just like just greased a couple palms for these nurses to make it way advantageous. Cause if you're coming here to Atlanta, Canada and you look at like, okay, one of them is paying you more. Uh, and since the budgets in New Brunswick was already passed, they couldn't then go back in retroactively and add more money for more nurses. And so we're basically offering more money to come here rather than go to New Brunswick. It's getting very competitive between oh, yeah. the provinces. I don't know if you've noticed, but a shitload of Alberta ads have been playing here. Oh, really? On like on you open YouTube, the ads are Alberta talking about how great Alberta is the radio. We look so one of my cars is a billion years old and it has no Bluetooth. Um, and so we listen to the radio a lot in there. And there is a shitload of Alberta ads. Like really? they're constantly like higher pays, the mountains. <sighs> and you're like better taxes. Better taxes. Gas is cheap. And you're like, and they're like, do you like these things? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I like these I do, things. I do, I do like these things. And like, amazing. Tell me more. Alberta has direct flights, Halifax to Calgary. And you're like, whoa, 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 what? And they're literally like aggressively, like everything, they, they do like a very, like they get you baited in and I'm like, hells yeah. And then they're like, Alberta. And I'm like, they're playing those. I, I've heard them in the last week. I've probably heard them like five times, which is a lot to be getting that much. Like, well, you know, who's also listening to those? Our new immigrant residents here in Nova yep, Scotia. who are probably like, damn man, things aren't going so good here. Yep. I read this thing and I think it was the Toronto Star. I can't remember. I think it was, it was Sun or Star or something. Yeah, I can't remember. And I think it was something like, Two out of five of new immigrants to Canada are contemplating moving back. To their country? Yep. To the country. Oh, 100%. I imagine, imagine coming from like, like India, man. Imagine coming from India, from like cities of like 20, 30, 40 million people that are absolutely exploding at the seams. Like every six weeks, a new city block is formed and like some new company starts and new technologies and there's new jobs all over the place. 
things are growing like a weed. You know the language, you know the culture, you have your family there. And no offense to Canada, but you roll up here and it's like this. There's freezing rain. It's cold as shit. And you're in a small city that we think is booming. But to them, they're like, bruh, this is like... I had a few clients that came here. They bought here from India. And they were like, man, my house on average was doubling every single year over there. That's crazy. Versus, Because I was like, man, you're making 20% on your real estate. (laughs) He's like, bro, I'm selling my house and I'm buying... He's like, I got four houses back in India. He's like, I'm going to buy five more because... Literally every year, if it's 100 grand, next year it's 200 grand. Yeah, that's and crazy. That actually takes me to a topic that I had written out here. I have a long winded, I guess this is my rant. I have a long winded rant that I want to go down. Um, because let's do it, man. This are is you a ready? Because I'm going to talk, rant. I'm going to talk about real estate, not about beating my kids. And listen, <laughs> <that's off. laughs> um, so to that point. Okay, so and this is something serious and something that I think it, some immigrants are starting to, to consider. Uh, obviously, uh, people don't come here. I don't think honestly to make money. They come here for safety, yep. security, yeah, yeah. comfort of lifestyle, uh, the overall general law-abiding citizens that we have, like all of those items. When it comes to making money, like like I said, you can you can do way better in other places. But this was something that I was thinking about because I was looking at the de-dollarization that's taking place. I'm sure everyone's seeing it everywhere now because with everything going on. China's making lots of moves to start settling large trades for commodities all around the world using yuan. And so to break that down a little bit, we all know that USA, US dollar, is the reserve currency for the world. And that means when we look at all the values of everything, it's based in US dollars. The big trades are made in US dollars. Countries that aren't, oh, I mean, I U- yeah, yeah. aren't even the states trade with USD. Like two countries that are not including USA will buy and trade let's say oil, and they will use U.S. dollars to make these trades. For the first time, not first time ever, but they're now a big push to go away from the USD. And so China's really Mm -hmm. pushing this because part of having the reserve currency, it gives you a lot of strength in the world, right? It makes your currency the most valuable. It It solidifies it. It It means you are not going to fluctuate. Other people are going to fluctuate against you. Exactly. And so now China, in their bid to take over the world, I'm assuming, they are really pushing that the yuan's going to take it over. And this war in Ukraine actually feeds into it because we're all like, oh, we're cutting off Russia. And Russia's like, all right, no problem. We're going to just trade with the yuan. And the countries that decide that they want to yeah. trade with us can still do so. And there's a bunch of countries that are willing to do so that they can almost survive off of. And so they're starting to do that. So you're seeing countries like uh, Brazil, Iran, uh, like China trade with non-USD. China just made a trade with France non-USD. So France is a... They're in EU countries, so that's that's a pretty in, in, interesting one. Um, but anyways, when I saw all this going on, I was like, all right, what does this mean for the real estate world? If we hop off the USD, it should tank the value of it, right? Assuming, because if you just look at it as a, as, a, as a commodity, I always like to go back to bananas. If you look at the USD like bananas, if everybody's trading bananas, they're worth a lot. But <laughs> if nobody bananas. wants the bananas... Or everyone starts using other using kiwis, bananas are going to lose value, right? So, by that happening, effectively everything in the states should become cheaper, right? Yeah. Which realistically should spur foreign investment, because there's lots of people who want to own real estate in the states still, even if the USD is gone. Not necessarily as an investment, but as an ability to go visit the states, right? Like people want to own foreign property. And it's also a hedge against different things. Like if, if the USD comes back, like it's good to diversify your portfolio. Big companies will do the same thing. Uh, they'll take an opportunity to buy a lot in the States. So realistically, that should help real estate go up. On mm-hmm. the flip side, when the U.S. dollar is worth less, inflation internally in the States will increase because if they're buying goods from yep, outside of town, to import, yep. they're going to have to import and things will be more expensive. We've talked about this for Canada. When that happens, obviously, then people have less money to spend, which can have a negative impact on the residential housing market. Additionally, if there's rampant inflation, a lot of times they'll try and correct that with interest rates, which also have a downward pressure on the real estate market. Okay. In conclusion, in conclusion, I don't know what the heck's going to happen. And I really, really struggle with it. But then it took me down the rabbit hole of looking at Britain's housing market because at one point in time, they had the reserve currency and they were before the USD. And so I want to see what happened to their market when things switched. Unfortunately, USD became reserve in 1944, pre-1944. Real estate market really wasn't this thing that we have today it was more looked at as a function of living or spaces to be used not as a form of investment so there wasn't a ton on that but while i was in that world and this is where i'm going with this whole thing 
was I was looking through kind of Britain's housing markets and their pricing over the course of the last 60, 70 years, basically. And this is what blew my mind. In the 1970s, houses were 5,000 pounds. Yeah. Okay. By the late Which right 2000s, now is probably 10,000 bucks in yeah, Canadian. Yeah, 10 grand. Dollars. By the mid to late 2000s, so like 30, 35 years later, they were 200 grand. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's, that's 40x. Since then, the late, like 2007, 2008, where do you think the average has gone? Since 2007, 2008? Yeah, it was 200,000 pounds then, so 400 grand. Yeah. Where do you think they stand today in pounds? Um, oof, I would say probably around, man. So I lived in Brighton for a while, which is a very expensive city south of London. And I remember a buddy of mine was purchasing uh, just northeast, I think, of London. Man, those are expensive areas, though. So there's going to be a lot of areas. I don't know, 700,000 pounds? 300,000 pounds. Oh. Yeah. Whoa. That's what I said. Man, that is a and, wide range because if, there's some, like, London is not cheap. No. And the other what? thing, to put this, another way to put this in perspective is if you look at that growth that they had from the 70s to the 2000s, that would be the equivalent of saying that the average house price in Canada by like 2055, even let's say 2060, is going to be $28 million. <laughs> That's a little pricey. So part of me starts to wonder, we're in a different generation of real estate. And so for these people that are moving from other countries that are just hitting their stride, it's a very interesting decision for them to move to a place like Canada or North America or a first world country that's been developed for a long time because now our appreciation on real estate, we look at like two to 3% a year on average, right? Like we went through our growth phase, right? Right. Britain went through their growth phase. Places like India, China, well, China seems to have gone through a big part of their growth phase as well. India's about to hit theirs or is going through theirs now. Um, so anyways, the whole thing was I started with de-dollarization and then I went down looking at Britain because I was trying to see their history. And as I was doing that, like I said, I looked through the home prices and it blew my mind. I was like, holy shit, it wasn't that long ago that you could buy a home for 5,000 pounds only in the 70s? Yeah, and that's now, really crazy. And then in the, by the 2000s, they were 200 grand. I was like, man, they had this crazy boom. And I always say that now because I look at like, you listen to all the stories here. I know so many people here, like Halifax was a little bit late to the boom. So like I hear about people who bought properties in the 80s and the 90s and like, yeah, man, I bought an apartment building down there for 10 grand a door in like the 80s. And I'm like, what? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, now it's worth 400,000 a door. And I'm like, okay, so you get 40X in 30 years, 40 years. Is it going to be worth 40X? Is it going to be worth 16 million a door in 40 years? Does that even make any sense? Yeah, we got to be plateauing. We got to be. And so again, if you look at Britain, they were like the first to have done it. They have now seen in the last 15 years only 50% growth, which is that 3% a year, which is kind of what we all end up expecting. And so all to bring it all the way back, if I'm an immigrant and I moved here and I'm investing in these kinds of things or I'm really looking at it on a true wealth like growth basis. You feel like you're getting in at the top instead of... Well, you're getting it, yeah. And it's just like, is it really... Again, there's all the safety, like... I'm sure between the 70s and the mid 2000s, when that that 40x took place, there was some boom busts that took, that went on that were catastrophic. But imagine like that. That's all. All to say, yeah, like I can totally see why an immigrant would be like, "Wait a second. And the other thing is, when you look at a place like India now, they're starting to have town sit like centers that are bigger than like freaking Halifax, probably bigger than Toronto, that are paved roads, beautiful glass buildings, like first world amenities. Right, because the original thing was like the idea was that the draw was like those places are so messy and and mis misrun and and like unsafe and this and that, but they're now starting to have these downtown cores that are super clean and they have all the first world amenities and they have the great restaurants and they have all the attractions and like they have law and order and so I'm like, do it? Does it really make sense that we're going to continue to drag like draw these people in? So listen to this, this, and, and I was kind of, while listening to that, I was searching for this thing because I came across it and it blew my mind and, and I think it's relevant. So I'm going to fire a little pop quiz at you. We're going to go, uh, around, um, Asia, major cities, and we're going to go a one bedroom apartment in the city center, right? One me- I'm not talking like some obscure right. rental wherever I'm talking 
downtown city center. Um, and I'm going to butcher, absolutely butcher the pronunciation of some <laughs> of these cities. Um, so I'm going to ask in Canadian dollars, yeah. I, I brought this whole thing up and everything. So Good. Sharjah UAE. And I, again, I'm, I'm, I apologize in mm-hmm. advance for my pronunciation. Uh, that's the most expensive uh, city in Asia in the city center. What do you think a one bedroom apartment is? Well, this is psycho. I'll give you a hint. It's psycho. Um, if you're saying psycho, it's psycho. I mean, UAE, it's not a cheap place, I don't think. 5,700. 8,800. Um, what? But that, that, I just do that one almost more for, for, for shits and giggles. It then drops off a cliff. You got Singapore just under 5,000. You've got Hong Kong just over 3,000. Again, these are like city center, one bedrooms. Then you got Dubai, which is 2,600. So already Dubai is the fourth highest in Asia, and it's down to 2,600. Okay. This is a one bedroom in the city center. Okay. What do you think a one bedroom is in the city center here? 2300. Yeah. So we're already close to, to, to Dubai. Let's continue to go down, and we're not going down that yeah, far. Shit, man. We are close to Dubai. So that is mental. Beijing, China, a one bedroom in the city center. How much do you think? Uh, if we're going down, we're at 22, 23. $1,564. Canadian dollars. This is what I was saying about this. Tokyo, Japan. Uh, city center, one bedroom. Canadian dollars. 1270. 1534. This but, is the shit I was saying a couple weeks ago, remember? Let's keep let's keep going down in, in Beirut. It's just over a thousand. Um, I'm trying to find so uh Ahmedabad. Is that how you pronounce that in India? <laughs> doesn't doesn't it, sound like it. <laughs> Neil, you're Indian. I know, but I, unfortunately there's a lot of places in India that I don't All right, know well, about. Mumbai. How much do you think city center Mumbai, one bedroom apartment in Canadian dollars? Mm, 897. $739. I was, I was, I was in the right mindset. You're, you're, in, you're in the right. So, you know, it would be. And how many people live shock. in Mumbai? How many people live in Mumbai? 25 million people. I don't know, but sounds well, like we it could out. be like, just so think about that for a second. Yeah. Like you said, Mumbai, it was, what was it? 700 and something? 700 and some hundred bucks. Like and you can live that's in a city with a can, population of 22 million people. And that's yeah. recorded. So in India, that probably means 30 million people live there. And they're able to keep their apartments in here. So I, and I, and they're probably maybe not quite as nice as their apartments here. Um, in, in fairness, I'm telling you, man, my family just got back coming. from India yeah. and they were showing me photos and videos of the stuff that they're like living in down there. Yeah. It's nicer than here. Yeah. So it's nicer than here, dude. I'm not even kidding. Like we, I'm like mind blown. Like these buildings are beautiful glass facades looking fresh. And I don't think those are probably $800 a month, but God damn, they're nice. Yeah. I was blown away. It's, it's going to be hard to keep people here coming here. If they come here and they're like, wait, this is what we're signing up for. eh? Um, yeah. Yeah. And someone and, out there asked about bricks, you know, bricks, I think it's one second. I'll Google it, but it's Brazil, Russia, yeah. India, China, and Kazakhstan. One second. No. Oh, we don't have a K. It's just no, K. it's a C. Oh, or, it's, it's a C. A, then it's then not oh. South Africa. So I think we should throw a K in there. So I think Kazakhstan are, to be on board. These are five emerging economies yeah. that are effectively joining forces, right? And when you think of the people there, mm-hmm. right? Brazil's not small. A good majority of the population. India's not small. China's not small. Russia's not small. Not small. I already, I already forget the They're other. They're like South the Africa, largest. Right? And if you also look d- geographically, like they very much circle the globe, right? Like you're going from you know, South America down to the tip of Southern Africa over to Asia and up to the Atlantic. Like they can cover the globe Mm -hmm. from a shipping perspective. They're also adjacent to a number of other highly populated early, early development economies. And they're currently what, probably 70% of the world's population? Well, they'd be up there. Probably maybe 60, 65. So and someone asked us about this and just kind of a general question. They're like, hey, talk about that. And I don't really know what they want us to talk about. And I haven't had any time to, to, to delve into it. But if the battle is for people and cheap products, ultimately, that's what the battle is for. And well, for a and while, living, living America could win this. And for a while, the Western world won that. Um, and as a result, their currency dominated. That currency you're talking about that is going to be tapped into these uh, economies, like, that is a major, major, major shift in world economics, that's not going to last for like five years. It's going to last for potentially five generations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
in the same way that that this political, you know, economic power system has has existed that had, you know, first England and then US for for the last um kind of half century. So this is real, man. And that it starts yeah, with a currency. Because if you're gonna do this, you're like, hey, we're gonna run shit uh and we're gonna trade, and we're gonna control the world market. The first thing we should maybe do is have our own standard currency and not be using this other one. Because those, if they took over, they would literally, to your point, be propping up the American dollar voluntarily, even though it is outside of their mm-hmm. party of five. Mm-hmm. Great show. Um, so all very interesting stuff. It, it's not looking good for us Westerners. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, like that's, it's, where, that's what I was trying to say. Is like I, like, like, and this is where I'm always like, we boil it back, especially for Canada, that immigration is the, the, our thing. Like this is our thing. The only, again, the saving grace I feel like for Canada in this whole thing is we've always just been like, Peace and friendship. We are all f- all good buds. Like we want everybody here, and I feel like a lot of people come here again for the safety of it. Because even in those emerging markets, like some people are just not interested in the absolute craziness that it is. Yeah, and they're like, I'm gonna go to Canada. I could probably make more money if I stayed in wherever I'm from, but I can sleep easy here every single night. I know my family will be taken care of. The healthcare, the education system, everything's more standardized. It's not a, uh, a dog eat dog world. It's a lot more relaxed. Economic welfare, li- life pace, and safe and and safety of countries. I mean, the anti-capitalists will not want to hear this, but capitalism tends to lead to safer countries, right? Because eventually, tourist dollars and flows of people, the powers that be realize, like, oh man, like we need to keep this place safe, or else no one's going to come here, mm. right? Even if you look at like what New York did in the whatever was the '90s, but also these countries, you know, down south, like that maybe have more organized crime. They tell them to like stay away from the tourist areas, right? Like having a robust economy relies on it being safe. And as, and so as economies develop, the countries tend to get a little bit safer. Um, so this will happen, you know, over time. I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see how this evolves over the next half century. This just feeds into Neil freaking out as per usual. I'm taking all my money. I'm moving to India. Oh man. Like if you were investing, these would be the markets to invest. It's so hard not to. I I have, again, I've, I have clients that have taken their money elsewhere. They've taken down to South America and stuff, and the returns are mental. Yeah. So even some of the rich people in this city have made their big money in other continents. Yeah. Like yeah. honestly, like you yeah, look yeah. at you look at some of like the craziest setups that are here, and some of the people who have the most not so stuff. They're here for the summer, and they've made all their money. In they started here, they made a bit of money, and they took it somewhere else. So, and, um. Anyways, I had up. a bunch of other articles. Yeah. We are at time because we're doing these two set segments. Yeah. That was. Um, that was a weird one. That was a weird one. Uh, let us know if you think Chandler's kid should fight more uh, because it sounds like he wants them to I'm fight not, more. Like, and I, I'm not pretending like I grew up in like fight club things. I, but but <laughs> like, Chandler has a fight I club at his house if you'd like to stop being a weenie. <laughs> no, I, I, but like, I was always in, encouraged through my peers to just like interact. And that's why I also believe in organized sports, right? Like you got to be in organized sports and, and learn these things. And sadly, that's not happening nearly as much as it once was. 100%. But I'm going to not get into these other articles that I have on here. Um, yeah. Because we have now filled this time up. And happy next, Monday. Happy Monday. We're going to switch to our next segment, which we're going to be doing some deal breakdowns, which I think a lot of you guys are going to be excited to hear about. We took deals that are on the market today, yeah. and we are going to break them down for you guys at a high level so you can see that there's still money to be made out there, even though the rates suck, and you should probably invest your money in India. You can still make money in Canada. See you in the next one. Thanks so much for watching the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. Don't forget to subscribe. But also check us out on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all the links below. Thanks again for checking us out. Broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh.